You know, if you're old enough to remember when Bjorn Borg would play at Wimbledon, he would start the tournament and he didn't have a beard. By the time the tournament was over and he won Wimbledon, he had a full beard. Jay Billis is maybe channeling Bjorn Borg because he's started his tournament beard. And what a compliment, Jay. That might be the nicest thing that I've ever said about you. The Bjorn Borg of college basketball, Jay Billis, joining us. Hi, Jay. Was was Bjorn Borg not the coolest dude that had ever lived at that time? <laughs> he was so amazed. Like, I love that dude. Yeah. He had the headband, the hair, but he would always start the tournament clean shaven. And then two weeks later, had a beard and he's, you know, holding a trophy and probably taking your girlfriend away from you. So you'll be you'll be doing some of those things in uh, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Except for the taking the girlfriend Absolutely. away. Part. Yeah. All right, make us smarter today. Where do you want to start? Um, do you do you like starting with who got left out? <laughs> no, or are you, no. Or, I have no sympathy for Rutgers or Vandy or Oklahoma State. What about Clemson? No, I don't. Jay, if you can't get in with sixty-eight, I mean, it's like you know qualifying for a bowl game and you win six games in college football. I mean, come on. Yeah, but they're letting other teams in that that aren't as good as you. That's the issue. Okay, um, you, I, I'll, I will tell you. I will tell you this: that that these leagues are are studying this stuff, and when they say total body of work, and then they start moaning about your non conference schedule. Well, how does your non conference schedule factor into total body of work? If your total body of work's good enough, it shouldn't matter. And I'm telling you, Dan, like some of these, some of the, these administrators now are talking about, why don't we start our own tournament and we'll invite all the Cinderella's and we'll pay them more, but we'll control everything. And that's, that's, I don't, I'm not saying it's imminent, but, but I've heard more of it. And, uh, and we could be seeing that in the future. There's okay, too wait, much wait money. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on. Go back and tell me what you think could be proposed at some point down the road. I think there is a chance in the future, and I'm not saying it's imminent, but a chance in the future where the the, the biggest conferences will say, "What? Why are we? Why are we letting somebody else control all of this, especially all of this money? Why don't we just start our own tournament?" Because, it, as you may recall, when we were kids, the NIT was bigger than the NCAA tournament. There were there were teams that turned down the NCAA tournament to play in the NIT. And then the NCAA came up with a rule that said, if you get invited to the NCAA tournament, you, you are not allowed to turn it down. Uh, and, and then they, they wound up getting sued by the NIT, had to buy it uh, because of that, that rule and some of those things that they did. But, but given how everything is changing, is it going to continue to change? And we're having all these conferences realign and, and the amount of money in this multi-billion dollar business is growing. Tournament inclusion is a big deal. And and having all of the you know having this committee decide this stuff when when the uh, the criteria is a moving target, um, I think I think I think that's going to be a possibility in the future. And, and again, I'm not saying it's it's going to happen anytime soon, but you're hearing more about it. And and I don't I don't see it uh, in the next few years. But we didn't see any of this conference stuff coming, and we didn't see everything growing to yeah. this point. 20 years ago and it would be a lot easier to start that stuff now like they don't have to start a whole structure all these conference offices are just as big as the ncaa office so it's not a it's not a heavy lift to do that yeah i always wondered and i i kind of uh grimace when i hear well you know what did this school do outside of the sec well they played an sec schedule i'm right. worried about their non-conference I would care what a team did in the conference in that tough of a conference, or if it's ACC, although you could argue maybe, you know, it was down this year, but these certain conferences where I go, I'm fine with what you did in your conference, not, you know, what did you do outside your conference? Is that a fair way to look at this? That That's in my view, that's the way to look at it is, is it's supposed to be the automatic qualifiers where everybody has the exact same opportunity to get in the tournament. You win your automatic bid against your that you chose to be with in your league. If you don't do that, it's the next best teams. That's the criteria. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying, well, this team didn't, you know, we need to send a message that you need to play a non-conference schedule. So what, what are we telling Clemson? Don't play smaller conference teams, period. Play big shots. And then people are going to say, well, you're not giving the little guy a chance. Well, you get punished for giving the little guy a chance. And God forbid you lose to a little guy yeah. on the road or something. Because Clemson played a bunch of road games. 
which which they're encouraged to do. And uh, and look, I, I'm I'm not like like I said, I'm not here to to you know take up the mantle for this team or that team. But when you're looking at other teams that got in, going, they're not as good as Clemson. Um, I, I do think that's a problem. Uh, but but it's not you know it'll all go away once the first game is played and we'll move on. North Carolina, the first preseason number one to miss the tournament since uh, they expanded to 64 teams in 1985. Last preseason number one team to miss the tournament was North Carolina State in 1975. All right, you want to? And weren't they on probation that year? NC State. Yeah, they won the tur- they won the championship the year before. I think they actually might have been on probation. I think. Um, let's see. The automatic bid went to North Carolina, and the at-large bid went to the regular season champ, Maryland. But I don't know if NC State was on probation for maybe the recruitment of David Thompson or something like that. But uh, I don't remember what it was, that but was the uh, last there was time. something in there. Yeah. What do you think of North Carolina turning down the NIT? I don't blame anybody for turning down the NIT. Uh, I mean, they if the players don't want to play, the fans don't want to see it, I don't see what the point is. And especially if you're going to go into the tournament and lay an egg and, and not want to be there. The, the only downside of that is they've got some younger players. And if they were going to be able to play those guys, that would be fine. If you had a younger team, I'd say go ahead and do it. But if they don't want to play, if the guys don't want to do it, and it sounds like they don't, uh, and the fans don't want to, don't want to watch it. Um, so, so I, I think it's a good decision. All right. What do you think of the four seeds? You okay with the top uh, number ones? Yeah. Um, you know, if you wanted to get technical about it, you know, look, look at all that Kansas did and, uh, and where they got sent, but they were still a number one seed. Uh, I thought Purdue got, uh, probably the toughest draw of number one seeds. Um, and, uh, and Alabama got a a pretty good one. Um, I kind of like Alabama's draw. Uh, the one, one bracket seems like it's loaded with Texas teams. You know, you got Texas, Texas A&M, Houston, all that stuff. So Mm -hmm. maybe they're thinking, let's get one Texas team in there, put them all in there. One of them's got to come out. I don't know, but um, it's a, it's a very, uh, you know, overall it's, it's fine. I don't, I don't have a whole lot of, a lot of qualms about the bracket. Other teams you like? I like UConn. Uh, um, I think they're playing well, even though they got beat by Marquette in the tournament. Marquette's legit. They're they're I think they're an elite eight team. Uh, the, they could very well run into Purdue or Duke. Uh, in that bracket and because of their length and rebounding and all that stuff. Mar- the only thing Marquette doesn't do well is, is rebound everything else. They do extraordinarily well. Uh, so I, I like Marquette coming out of the bottom part of that. And, uh, and Duke is playing really well now. Like I think Duke is 17 and one when they have their full complement of players. And uh, they've been patiently bringing that team along. And for those that say you can't win with freshmen, um, you know, that's kind of been proven wrong by Kentucky and Duke over the years. But, uh, but this team is, is just about freshman dominated. Their best players are freshmen, Kyle Filipowski. But they, man, they're so good defensively. And now their offense is caught up. Like they're making shots and spreading the floor. And uh, and they, they look like lottery picks now. Now now you say that they'll probably go out and have to repaint the rims <laughs> in their first few games. But they're 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 legit. They're very good. And they got Oral Roberts to start out. And Oral Roberts is good. Um, you remember Oral Roberts beat Ohio State a couple of years ago, and they still have the same guard Max Asmus, spelled A B M A S, and it's pronounced Asmus. Uh, but they they actually Oral Roberts might actually be a better team. Um, than they were then. Mm-hmm. They're they're a little bit more balanced. They've got a seven four kid named Connor Vanover who uh, who went to Arkansas. He was at Arkansas before he came to Oral Roberts. Uh, but Ace Smith is like a 20, 25, uh, 22 point a game guy, give or take, and and he can really score. And uh, he's one of those guys that can go out and get you thirty in a game and be a problem. But I think Duke is too big and too athletic. Uh, and and their rim protection is so like it blocks and changes so many shots around the rim. I think they're going to be too hard to beat for ORU. We're talking to Jay Billis from the Mothership. What is it about certain coaches when they get to the tournament that it, it's just different than the regular season? Like Tom Izzo every year, you know Rick Pitino. It feels like I mean there, there's a few coaches where you go. I don't care what they have, they somehow get the most out of them, and we shouldn't be surprised when they go on a tournament run. Yeah, I think there's a, you know, I, I can only go to some of my experience on this. And when I was, uh, I played in the first 64 team bracket. 
uh, it, the year before, I think it was 54, we had a buy in the tournament. Uh, in my, the first time I played in it. And when it got to 64, I remember as a junior in college thinking, my God, this thing is huge. You know, and, and your head was spinning with all the, all the stuff going on around it. And it, it's probably even worse now with the lower third and stuff going up the side and all the results. And my senior year, we were the number one overall seed. And Coach K came into the locker room uh, for a team meeting, and we started talking about the bracket. And he, and he talked about the other side of our bracket, the, the 32 teams that were on the other side. And he's going, look at, all the, look at all the good teams over there. And then he said, who cares? And he goes, there's only one team coming out of there, and we'll play them on Monday night. <laughs> and then, th- then he gave us a sheet that had a four-team bracket, and it was our first weekend. And he goes, all we have to do is go to Greensboro. It was called the Greensboro Invitational. And he says, we've got a four-team tournament to play this weekend. And it made it manageable for us. And you started thinking about, you know, it's not a golf tournament. We don't have to beat everybody. We just got to beat the ones in our path. And if somebody falls down, fine, we'll play the one that beat them. But we don't have to worry about all this stuff. And honestly, Dan, like I'm kind of a, uh, I'm kind of a history guy. I can remember just about everything from all the tournaments I've watched and covered and all that. The one thing, the one tournament I can't remember what happened in was the, that one because I didn't, we didn't think about anything but us. And I do think like Izzo and, and Patino and Coach K and some of these others uh, that you're, that you're referencing, they do a good job of that, of, of this is about us. Like I can't imagine that Roger Federer went into a tournament worrying about the other side of the Wimbledon bracket. Um, uh, it, it, there, there is something about like the focus thing and, and like, if you win your first couple games and then you go home, that's usually the time where things get, you know, you start getting media coverage and patted on the back and thinking you're really good and all that. And, and, you know, it's, it's sort of the focus issue of, of your specific path over this entire tournament, which, which shouldn't matter to you. Where do you think Rick Pitino is coaching next year? I don't know. I keep hearing the St. John stuff. I, I, I know probably about as much as you do. Um, <clears throat> you know, I field phone calls every once in a while, but I try not to get involved in any of that stuff. But um, I, I, th- I think he's, it's still in his blood and he still wants to do it. And St. John's would make great sense. He wouldn't have to move from, from where he lives now. Uh, and it would work out really well. And he'd kill it there. He'd do really well. Uh, and I'm kind of glad. The only, the only downside of this, if you want to call it a downside, is, uh, is, man, these guys are going a long time. And, uh, and, you know, for some of the younger guys, like, like when you look at John Shire now at Duke, um, man, they're having to wait a long time, uh, to get a shot and to get a shot at some of the big ones. Like so many, so many, like when John Wooden retired, I was, I think I was in sixth grade living in LA. And, and when he announced his retirement at the final four in 1975, I thought he was the oldest man in the world and he was 65. <laughs> And, uh, you know, all the, there's so many 70 year old guys and Bayheim, I mean, you know, Bayheim was what, 78. <laughs> and that, that was unimaginable to me. So, so there, there's kind of like, don't these guys play golf? <laughs> um, I, I even called coach K one time, I called to, to check in on him, see how he was doing after, after, uh, uh, he left the program and, uh, he answered the phone and I said, uh, how are the pickleball games going? And he says, no, I'm really, I'm really busy. And I was like, I was just kidding. <laughs> I was just joking. <laughs> but you know what it is? There's certain guys who can't, I just remember when Brent Musburger talked about Joe Paterno, he said he'll die coaching that he would never, he would never stop that, that if you retire, you die and that he would stay in the job that, that amount of time. And I, I think there's certain guys who they don't know what they would do if they didn't coach. So why not coach as long as you can coach? That was kind of Beheim's thing. Um, I remember Beheim saying that he was getting a lot of phone calls from friends of his that had retired saying, don't retire. Um, like, don't quit because I wish I was still doing it. And, uh, and I don't think he needed that to keep going. But, um, but look, if, if people love it, I don't have it. Like, I'm not saying, hey, you should quit at a certain age. But I mean, for crying out loud, they make airline pilots retire and, and their retirement age is and other things. Um, uh, but but I, I wind up thinking about sort of the uh, the younger guys that I think would do extraordinarily well. It's just hard for them to uh, it's just hard for them to get in there with uh, with guys hanging around longer. But there's so much money in it. Yeah. And, uh, and 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 look, and, and it's still fun for them. 
Um, they get to wear shorts to work every day. And I'm not sure guys their age should be wearing <laughs> shorts, but but that's okay. <laughs> Who's your pick to win it all? I took Arizona. Um, and look, Arizona has some issues. Like they're not the best defensive team, but they can really score. They average about 19 assists per game, and their big guys are really good. Um, and I think their guards are good, but they're, you know, they may be at times a little bit, you know, decision making you may quarrel with, but, you know, Kirk Kreese is really a, I think he's a really good guard and Courtney Ramey transferred in from Texas and hit a huge shot against UCLA to win uh, the Pac-12 championship uh, in the tournament. Um, I, I like their path, uh, but, you know, Alabama's legit. They're really good. And, uh, and I could see, you know, if there's an Arizona Alabama game uh, in the Elite Eight. Um, that's going to be a that's going to be a fist fight. Good to talk to you. We'll talk to you along the way. As always, we appreciate your time, Jay. And Dan, even though in your late you're in your late seventies, I don't I don't think you should quit anytime soon. Yeah. Do you know I'm older than John Wooden when John Wooden retired? Yes. Yeah. I didn't want to bring that up, but I thought he was the oldest man in the world, and you know I, I don't want to say anything more. Who's had a better career, me or John Wooden? I think Wooden would love your career. You. Um, you know, like the, your pyramid of success has some different <laughs> blocks on it, but that's but the, very impressive. That's the only defense played in my pyramid where the actual blocks there. There was <laughs> that was it. Uh, thank you, Jay. Thank you, brother. And that's Jay Billis. He works for the Mothership. He knows more basketball than you do. 